Right. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks. Um, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jessica DiPrimo. I am a supervising staff specialist here at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. And I am joined today by Megan Mabry, Tommy Wynn, and Itzel Guzman, staff specialists with the off-road section of the Strategic Incentives Division. Today's webinar is specifically tailored to off-road equipment dealerships and will count as your training in order to meet the qualifications as an approved dealership at Bay Area Air Quality Management District. We will focus on the different types of grant opportunities, basic eligibility requirements you'll need to know for your customers, and specifically on our Off-Road Equipment Replacement Program, or ERP, including the dealership role, application assistance, and inspections. And please note that this webinar is being recorded. I'll pass this over to Megan now to go over our housekeeping. Hello, everyone. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's training. Here is a screenshot of the Zoom interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop at the bottom of your screen. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, select the up arrow to the right of your microphone button, which will pop up a menu. Select the switch to phone option and enter in the dial-in information in your invite email to join by phone. Please be aware that you will not be able to unmute use your video or share your screen during today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and the slides will be emailed to you along with the program fact sheets, ERP dealer summary guide, and ERP summary of quick steps after today's webinar. You can also email Tommy Wynn at twin at backmid.gov for copies as well. Lastly, you will have the opportunity to submit questions on today's presentation by typing in your questions in the chat section using the chat button and sending it to either myself, the host, which um, shows up as Megan questions, or to everyone. You may also send in your questions um, at any time during the presentation, and we will collect them and answer all questions during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. We will only be able to answer questions during the webinar that are received through the chat and will not be taking live audio questions or calling on anyone who has a raised hand. When you're entering your questions, please tell us if you are asking about ag equipment, construction equipment, stationary equipment, or another kind of equipment. Now I would like to introduce Tommy Wynn. Thank you, Megan and Jessica. Uh, my name is Tommy and I am a staff specialist here at the Air District. In today's presentation, we'll provide you with high level dealership training for the Air District Equipment Replacement Program or ERP. We'll start with some background on the Air District and the Grants Division, and then dive deeper into the Carl Moyer Program and the Community Health Protection Program. We'll then discuss the Equipment Replacement Program for off-road equipment. We'll then follow with information about the general role of the dealer and the required steps throughout the grants process, specifically the dealer's role in application assistance and inspections. At the end of the presentation, we will be available to answer any questions during a Q&A session. However, please feel free to send questions to your designated recipient throughout the process. We should be wrapping up in about 45 minutes. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm just gonna start over on this slide um, on the background about who we are. Um, at the Air District, we are responsible for regulating stationary sources of air pollution in the region, protecting and improving public health, air quality, and the global climate. The Air District was established in 1955, and it is the first regional air pollution control agency in the country, currently serving over 7 million residents located throughout the nine Bay Area counties. The Strategic Incentives Division, which is the division that we all work in here, provides grant funding to target emission reductions from mobile sources with the goal of funding technologies and projects that have the greatest potential to reduce criteria pollutants, toxic air contaminants, and greenhouses, greenhouse gases here in the Bay Area. Funding is also prioritized to help improve air quality in the district's priority areas, which include highly impacted communities and disadvantaged and low-income communities. Next slide, please. 
The Air District has more than $90 million available for voluntary projects that reduce air pollution from heavy duty engines before they're required to be replaced by law. The Air District directly sought input from the community to identify local air pollution sources and areas of concern. As such, priority funding is given to projects that reduce emissions in both the Air District's highly impacted communities and in the AB 617 communities listed on the slide. Funding is offered on a first come, first served basis until all funds have been allocated. And if eligible applicants may be able to co-fund with other incentive programs. If your customer is intent on co-funding, it's important to understand the requirements for each of the grant programs before starting the application process. These are the types of projects that we can fund. The most common projects type, type we see are the equipment replacements. This is the replacement of older, dirtier equipment with newer, cleaner equipment that meets or exceeds the current required emission standards. Repower projects are projects where the existing engine is replaced with a newer emission certified engine. Equipment conversion projects are projects where an existing engine is converted to a cleaner engine that provides motor power or changes the fuel type used, such as hybrid or electric conversions. Infrastructure funding is also available for alternative fuel and charging stations that support eligible equipment. Standalone infrastructure projects may also be eligible for funding. For the off-road category, we can fund different types of diesel and large spark ignition, mobile and portable equipment that operate at least 75% of the time in the Bay Area. Common equipment types include dozers, loaders, excavators, scrapers, forklifts, ground support equipment, portable generators, concrete pumps, and wood chippers. All equipment submitted for consideration must be compliant with any applicable regulations or be exempt registered, permitted, reported, and have enough time before any compliance deadline to fund a project. It's important to be familiar with which regulations your customer's off-road equipment falls under in order to determine funding eligibility, compliance, and any regulatory requirements the equipment may be subject to. Zero emission replacement projects in this category are highly encouraged. For all projects, funding is available to cover up to 80 to 85% of eligible project costs, depending on the project type. The most common project is equipment replacement, which is generally funded up to 80%. Looking now at the agriculture category, we can fund different types of diesel and large spark ignition mobile portable and stationary equipment that operate at least 75% of the time in the Bay Area. Common equipment types include tractors, tractor loaders, wheel loaders, forklifts, portable generators, and water pumps greater than 25 horsepower operating in ag operations. As with the off-road category, all regulated project equipment must be compliant and in good standing with any applicable regulations. The Air District's mobile Agricultural zero emission equipment replacement category is to encourage ag equipment transition to zero emission. Additional funding can be provided for zero emission specific needs, such as an additional battery pack or a fueling support system. This slide shows the basic requirements for stationary and portable ag engines, as there are some specific nuances to these project types. Eligible equipment for this project category are in-use stationary and portable diesel engines, and they must meet the horsepower, location, usage, and tier characteristics listed on this slide. That is, to fund any engine older than tier 3, the engine must be either sized between 25 and 50 horsepower, or it must be remotely located, be an emergency standby, or be an emergency standby generator set. Diesel engines 50 horsepower and greater must be registered with the Air District, and portable engines 50 horsepower and greater must be registered with California's Portable Engine Replacement Program to be eligible for funding. The project life may be one to three years for engines subject to the Stationary Diesel Engine Air Toxic Control Measure, or ATCM, depending on the type of engine. 
For engines subject to regulations, the project must be complete with the engine installed and operational for at least one year before the associated ATCM compliance date, or at least three years before the CARB PERP regulation and the portable engine ATCM. Today's training is specifically focused on the equipment replacement program, which are mainly covered by the Carl Moyer and the community health protection programs here at the district. These projects are for equipment that will be replaced sooner compared than through normal attrition or due to any compliance requirements. This slide lists the basic eligibility requirements for the off-road and ag equipment categories. Eligible fleets must be in compliance with all applicable laws and regulations. The existing equipment must also have at least one to three years before any compliance deadlines from the California Air Resources Board or the Air District and documentation of compliance must be provided as part of the application. Existing diesel equipment must have a tier zero through a tier three engine. And in most cases, the replacement engine must be a tier four final or cleaner. Existing large spark ignition equipment must also be at least 25 horsepower and be replaced with the cleanest available standard. The replacement equipment must be 25 horsepower or greater and the replacement horsepower generally cannot be more than 25% increase beyond the existing equipment's horsepower. Increases up to 35% may be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. In addition, zero emission replacement equipment less than 25 horsepower can be approved on a case-by-case -case basis also. Applicants are required to provide documents to show two years of ownership and usage for the equipment they want to replace. And finally, the existing equipment must be destroyed and scrapped within 60 days of delivery of the new equipment to your customer. To expand on the compliance requirement, fleets and equipment must be in full compliance with all applicable regulations and registered with CARB and or the Air District to receive funding. Funding cannot be used to bring equipment into compliance and funded equipment cannot be used towards compliance requirements while under contract. The most common regulations that the off-road equipment may be subject to are listed on the slide here and they include the off-road regulation, the large spark ignition regulation, the cargo handling equipment regulation, PERP and the stationary ATCM regulations, and the statewide truck and bus regulation. This may not be a complete list of applicable regulations and note that the Air District is not the regulatory agency responsible for these regulations. Please have your customers contact CARB if they're unsure what regulations apply to their fleet and equipment. Grant funding is only available to cover eligible project costs. For equipment replacements, eligible costs typically include the base cost of the replacement and any additional features that may exist on the baseline or a safety requirement. The district determines eligibility on a case-by-case -case basis. Some examples of this include the presence of four-wheel drive, a cab, or a loader attachment on the baseline equipment, which may be eligible for funding on the replacement equipment or weights required for safe operation of equipment on a hillside terrain. The Air District cannot fund any premium additions or options, extended warranties, docking fees, non-essential attachments, or other optional upgrades. These costs are the responsibility of the applicant. It's important to note all upgrades and attachments on the replacement equipment must be itemized and accurately reflected on the equipment quote, even when the additional items are not eligible for reimbursement. If the applicant is proposing to replace a baseline equipment with zero emission equipment, they may also be eligible for funding for the associated charging infrastructure. For infrastructure funding, uh, the types of eligible projects include battery charging stations, hydrogen fueling stations, stationary ag pump electrification, shore power, and other infrastructure projects on a case-by-case -case basis. Funding is available to cover up to 50% of eligible project costs, with potentially higher funding amounts available for projects located at sensitive receptor locations or projects powered by solar or wind. 
That's it for me for now. I'll hand it over to Itzel to talk you through the grants process. Thanks, Tommy, and hi, everybody. Uh, so next, we're gonna go over some examples of potential funding amounts. In the first line, we have a 2008 tier three uh, rubber tired loader replaced with a 2022 tier four engine that's eligible for up to 80% of project costs. However, this unit's funded at a lower amount because it's less cost effective going from a tier three to a tier four engine. Uh, in the second example, we have a 1997 tier zero tractor replaced with a 2022 tier four final tractor funded at 80% of eligible costs. Like Tommy mentioned previously, the purpose of this program is to reduce toxic pollutants. So the removal of older, more heavily polluting equipment is more cost-effective than newer, less polluting equipment. The third line shows how actual funding is dependent on the cost-effectiveness of a project. Like in this case, a tier three tractor replaced with a tier four final tractor is eligible for the maximum funding, unlike the rubber tired loader in the first line. And then in the fourth example um, is a 1987 tier zero excavator replaced with a 2022 tier four final excavator and receiving only 66% of costs. Then in the last example, we have a 2001 tier two portable horizontal wood grinder replaced with a 2019 wood grinder with electric infrastructure. Now this project is eligible for 80% of funding for the grinder costs and also 50% of funding for the infrastructure costs. So you as the dealer can reach out to any uh, one of our team members to complete a cost effectiveness request before submitting um, or before beginning an application with a customer. What this means is that you can submit details of a potential piece of equipment to receive an estimate of funding amounts and contract terms. This way you can know if a piece of equipment is a good candidate for the program prior to starting on an application. Now here's what you can, you can inspect, uh, expect from the uh, grants process overall. Uh, first, an interested applicant works with the approved dealer to prepare an application. District staff will then review the application and request any additional information necessary to determine eligibility. If eligible, uh, staff will notify the applicant and the dealer about preliminary funding approval. And at that point, a pre-inspection of the existing equipment uh, will be conducted by the district or the dealer. Once the pre-inspection is approved, a contract is then signed by the applicant and the Air District. The Air District then authorizes the dealer to order the new equipment. Uh, however, please note that no equipment may be ordered before the contract has been signed and district staff has notified both the grantee and dealer that the equipment can be purchased. Now, once the new equipment has arrived, the dealer or district will perform a post inspection before approving release of this new equipment. Then the dealer uh, must send the old equipment to a dismantler for destruction within 60 days of the customer taking possession of the new equipment. The dismantler will then destroy the equipment and district staff will perform a destruction inspection to release it for scrapping. At that point, the dealer will work with the grantee to prepare a payment package for the district's review. And uh, please note that payments are uh, made directly to the grantee only. So next, we're, we're going to jump into the dealer role throughout this whole grant process. Much of the dealer role um, occurs before a project is approved for funding, so primarily during the application stages. Uh, contracted dealers are expected to provide customers with accurate program inf information and guidance. So dealers uh, also assist their customers with the online registration and application, ensuring that all required documents are included in that initial submittal. And upon review of the application, district staff will correspond with both customer and dealer to gather any additional information um, to determine eligibility. And please note that although customers are expected to assist uh, Customers with the application process, they're not allowed to submit the applications on the customer's behalf. 
the customer or uh, at this point applicant themselves must submit the application through the application portal. So when a project has been approved for funding, the dealer assists with a few more tasks, primarily with inspections. So for any unregulated equipment, the dealer will conduct the pre-inspection of the baseline equipment. Uh, however, for any regulated equipment, the district staff will complete the pre-inspection. After the contract is signed by all parties and the dealer and grantee receive official notice from the district to proceed, the dealer will order the new equipment and help arrange for any applicable installations such as charging stations, et cetera. Upon receipt of the new equipment, the dealer will coordinate with district staff to schedule the post inspection and inspect the new equipment. The dealer will then assist in coordinating the destruction inspection of the baseline equipment as well. And finally, the dealer will help the applicant, now the grantee, prepare the uh, package for reimburse, uh, reimbursement, which includes the equipment invoices, salvage yard receipt, and signatures. And please note that, that dealers are subject to inspect to audit inspection by the Air District or California Air Resources Board. Now moving on to the application assistance portion. The application is uh, to be completed through our Carl Moyer application portal, uh, which is linked on this slide. For each unit in an application, we require the following documents. One is the ownership documents demonstrating that the customer has owned the equipment for at least two years. Two is a uh, usage documentation for the past two years showing that the equipment is in operational condition. This can include hour meter readings, maintenance, service, or repair records, and must be linked to the piece of equipment. And for both items one and two, other forms of documentation may be approved on a case-by-case -case basis as well. Number three uh, is the current uh, general liability insurance. Number four, uh, only applicable to customers subject to the CARB off-road or LS LSI fleet regulation will need three compliance documents uh, through the CARB door system. And number five, a quote and manufacturer spe spec sheet of the replacement equipment. The quote must be current, itemized, and have the sales tax percentage Purchase orders or sales orders can't be accepted. We also highly recommend providing spec sheets or other documents for the baseline equipment confirming the model year and horsepower rating. Uh, number six is an executive order which shows the CARB or EPA certification of the equipment. And lastly, number seven is a signed Air District regulatory compliance statement. Please refer to the vendor guide um, that we'll send out for more details on each of these documents. So regarding quotes and itemization, here's a simplified example of how quotes should be itemized out. It's important to add all features or attachments as separate line items on the quote and include whether they have an additional cost or part of the base unit price, uh, even when items aren't eligible for reimbursement. In this example, we have the base tractor cost of 73,000 and the cab listed as a separate line item with no extra cost. The note indicates that the, that the tractor only comes in the cab configuration and baseline uh, was equipped with a cab, which is useful for determining like for like eligibility. We also see a loader and loader arm options with additional costs. Uh, the notes also indicate that the baseline was equipped with a loader. So we'll consider the loader and attachment arm to be eligible costs as well as tax on applicable items. And highlighted in red is an item that was not on the baseline and the district would consider ineligible. Uh, this cost would be covered by the customer. And the notes explanation column referenced here can be reflected either on the quote, in an email, or document outlining costs if your quote system doesn't allow you to make edits directly. And here's some information on um, the doors uh, documents that we'll, we need for, for those um, 
with regulated equipment. The upper left shows a picture of the door's login screen, and below it are the applicable tabs the applicant will navigate to when logged into the system, which are vehicle and engine, compliance snapshot, and uh, vehicle funding. The top right is a preview of what the compliance snapshot will look like. The snapshot printout should have a table with the fleet average, uh, fleet target and average emission rates, compliance requirements, compliance summary, and fleet size. And then the middle right is a DOORS full fleet list. The bottom right uh, shows what a funded vehicle list will look like, which refers to any equipment previously funded through the Carl Moyer program. And if you need any further assistance with DOORS, please call their hotline directly. So for now, I'll pass it back to Tommy to get into our destruction or inspections. Thank you, Itzel. Uh, now I will go over the dealer's role in the inspection process. Dealers are key in coordinating inspections, assisting in showing equipment to the district staff, and in some cases, performing the inspections themselves. There are three inspections for each project. The pre-inspection, which is done prior to project approval for funding and is intended to inspect the baseline equipment and verify provided information and equipment operability. The post-inspection, which is done after receipt of the new equipment and prior to release to the customer. This is intended to inspect the replacement equipment and verify information and equipment operability as well. And lastly, the destruction inspection is done after the baseline equipment has been destroyed, but prior to full scrappage. This inspection is to ensure the baseline equipment is properly destroyed in accordance with district requirements and occurs prior to reimbursement. Most inspections are done by district staff, either in person or virtually. And as mentioned previously, dealers typically perform the pre-inspection for unregulated equipment. This pre-inspection process includes taking date stamped photos of the baseline equipment, engine, and hour meter. The dealer will also fill out a provided inspection form and denote equipment and operability. The photos and a completed form are provided to the district for review. It's important to note to take as many photos as possible at various angles to clearly show the equipment, their serial numbers, and their locations on their baseline. This will help staff identify and verify the equipment after it has been destroyed. Again, all other inspections are completed by the district. District-led inspections may be done two ways, in person or virtually. Virtual inspections are done through a live stream video device, typically a smartphone or a tablet. And prior to virtual inspection, the dealer or applicant will take date stamped photos of the equipment and provide them to the district staff for review along with a signed affidavit form stating the provided photos are an accurate and true representation of the equipment. District staff will review the photos and schedule a video call with the applicant or dealer. The district staff will review the equipment via video to ensure it matches the photos and will finalize the inspection form. For in-person inspections, no photos or signed affidavit by the dealer or applicant are necessary. For these, district staff will coordinate with the applicant or dealer to schedule an inspection at the equipment site. The purpose of the destruction inspection is to ensure the baseline equipment is destroyed in accordance with Carl Moyer requirements. The destruction must be performed to ensure that the baseline equipment is inoperable and unrepairable. This slide lists the specific requirements for the destruction and will be provided to the applicant and dealer upon release of the new equipment to the customer. District staff will be guiding you as the dealer and the project applicant through throughout the entirety of the grants process. Lastly, it is very important that the equipment and engine serial numbers are still visible on the destroyed equipment at the time of the destruction inspection. Here's an example of uh, destroyed equipment. The top right photo shows the required irregularly shaped three inch hole in the engine block. And below that photo is a photo that shows what a severed frame looks like. Now I'm going to pass it off to Jessica to explain some recent changes we have adopted for the year 25 cycle. Thanks, Tommy. I want to draw everyone's attention to some important changes we've made for this Moyer year going forward. 
First, please be aware that there are new restrictions for projects that are subject to regulations, that is non-agricultural projects. These projects must be located within one of the Bay Area District's priority areas in order to qualify for the program. Priority areas include Oakland, Richmond San Pablo, Bayview Hunters Point, Southeast San Francisco, and other various areas designated as disadvantaged or low income communities, which are available on the online interactive map tool that we shared with you over email. These areas are becoming more and more of our focus. In order to certify that a project is in a qualifying location for non-ag projects, you must fill out a geographic eligibility form. Next, be aware that the cost effectiveness limits have increased. This is for agricultural and non-ag going forward here. Uh, this will make it easier for your customers to get to the 80% mark. We are in notice with the large 522,000 per ton limit for zero emission, we are especially incentivizing zero emission uh, machines. And next, we have a new internal policy at the district, placing a lot more emphasis on the timing with which we complete our application evaluations. We always respond to new applications with a confirmation email listing several questions. It is important that we get complete information and answers to all of our questions within five business days. When unanswered questions are taking longer than five business days to resolve, we may cancel the application and ask the applicant to reapply. Please be aware of this new policy and be sure to keep in touch with us if you anticipate any delays in resolving the initial application questions. Next, I think you'll be pleased to hear we have made our horsepower increase policy more flexible. Increases of 125% to 135% are allowed as long as you certify there are no other comparable units available that can perform the same function as the baseline within the 125% range. Increases above 135% are allowed in certain situations, but the customer must pay extra for an increase that large. There's also the opportunity for a customer to opt for an engine larger than 125%, even if one exists in the 125% range, they would just have to pay the difference in cost for the larger machine. Uh, finally, I'm pleased to announce we have expanded our list of eligible costs. Uh, we've had some challenges in the past getting things like weights or other things approved as eligible costs, but we now have a mechanism for funding any item or feature that is essential to ensure the replacement equipment can perform the same function as the baseline. This means items like blade attachments, wheel weights, straw bar, clevis, and other essential parts could be eligible for reimbursement if you are able to provide sufficient justification and explanation for why they are needed. You must demonstrate that the proposed items are either on the baseline, well, on the baseline and essential to ensure the replacement equipment can perform the same function as the baseline. Also, just wanna point out, make sure you itemize the cost of freight. That is eligible now and it wasn't before. In order to make all this work, we need to get clear and direct information from you. Keep in mind, we will need to hear a good description of what the baseline equipment does. When you build a piece of equipment and select which components are needed, what considerations did you take into account? The work that the baseline does, along with the terrain it works on, if applicable, should all be communicated to us so we can justify the costs of the components you itemize. I'm repeating an earlier slide here to drive the point home about eligible costs. The justifications here in the notes column are the kinds of things we're looking for in order to verify eligible costs. Last but not least, I want to make a special announcement about forklifts. Forklift vendors, please be advised the opportunity for replacing large spark ignition forklifts, that is propane, LPG, gasoline, et cetera, is going to shrink significantly when the new zero emission forklift rule is adopted by CARB this June. This means your customers with these types of forklifts who have been on the fence about considering Moyer do not have much longer to apply before their eligibility possibly goes away. We strongly encourage forklift operators to apply for Moyer funding during this year 25 funding cycle, which ends on March 28th. Note, this does not apply to diesel forklifts, which are already limited by the CARB off-road diesel regulation. 
I also want to call attention to the Volkswagen Mitigation Trust, or VW program. This is a separate program focused on heavy lift forklifts, among other zero emission freight and marine equipment. This is another funding opportunity for forklift owners if they have heavy, heavy lift forklifts. Please feel free to contact us for more information about this program. And now I'm going to pass the mic back to, back to Itzel to finish up our presentation. Thanks, Jessica. So now that we've covered the dealer role and the recent changes, uh, we'll discuss the steps to actually becoming an approved dealer. Uh, so first, uh, dealer interested dealers are required to watch today's training and review the entirety of the Air District Dealer Summary Guide, which outlines all the steps uh, that the dealer must um, comply with in detail. Uh, and a link to today's training will be made available upon request for those interested um, and those unable to attend today. After completing the training and reviewing the guides, staff will provide the dealer with the training certification form to complete and sign. Uh, and once we receive that form, dealers can notify us that they want to enter into con contract to participate in the program. And only one agreement or contract per dealership is necessary, even if several locations will participate in the program. But we will need each location's address, contact information uh, to be listed on that contract. And in the case of franchise dealerships under different owners, each location will require its own contract. What we'll need is a signatory information, dealership location, and uh, contact details to prepare the contract. The dealership must also provide copies of their California business license for the past two years. Uh, our business office will then provide the dealership with the contract and instructions to complete and sign. So once that contract is fully executed, meaning it's signed by all parties, the dealership will be listed on the district website as an approved dealer that potential applicants can work with. And here are a few additional resources, including links to the Clean Off-Road Equipment Voucher Incentive Project, California Core website, CARB Off-Road Zone, uh, the contact information for the CARB Diesel Hotline, and the VW program that supports heavy lift forklifts, among other zero emission projects. Finally, here are links to our program website, as well as the contact information for the staff members who, who lead these programs. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions regarding any of our grant programs. And that concludes today's uh, dealer training. We'll now take a quick five minute break to give you a chance to submit any questions. Uh, feel free to submit questions using the chat button if you haven't already done so. Thanks everyone, we'll be back shortly. Hey everyone, so uh, we are, uh, we have a very small audience today, uh, just a few vendors are on the line right now, and we're happy to take your questions. Please make sure to type them into the chat if you have any questions. Um, there's one question um, currently um, in, on our radar that we'd like to answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this out and then it's a little answer. If an applicant is working with two vendors, can the applicant submit two applications, one with each vendor? So previously, um, you know, we've had projects where we have m multiple vendors working on one project, um, but that can lead to either delays from, you know, either vendor um, trying to get all the information in, and that can lead to, you know, confidentiality issues. So um, the short answer is yes, uh, applicants uh, can submit two separate applications with a separate vendor. Um, so that's going to con conclude our questions for now, unless anybody else in the audience has any questions you'd like to ask. We're also always available for you um, via email or phone. You have our contact information. Um, we'll be supplying the recording of this training on our website. And there will be an ERP vendor guide being sent out as soon as it's finalized, probably within the next couple of weeks. 
if there are no questions, then we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.